I love to get into the Word. And one thing that I'm, I'm a stickler for, and that is I'm a stickler for God's love in our hearts to express it. And as we know more of the Word of God, the more we understand what's been left us and given us, and even Jesus helping us to receive it. Say amen, somebody. Everyone say amen, somebody. <laughs> All right. So we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. How many know it has to be in Christ? Uh, amen. And we're going to call the subtitle of this, if you're taking notes, Being Moved with Compassion. Being Moved with Compassion. Amen. We're going to turn and read our scripture. Amen. All right, so this deals with the thing that we're going to be talking about, the compassion of the Lord. We're going to give you a de definition of compassion here a little bit in the lesson. So it says, finally, all of you be of one mind. This is the hard thing. The church seems very scattered, very, very, I don't compartmentalized. I don't know how to say it. We don't need to be that way. We need to be focused on God. Finally, all of you be of one mind having com what? Compassion, one for another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, yelling at each other. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing, the word knowing there means know by experience and observation that you were called to this very thing, that you may inherit a what? A blessing. For he who would love life, how many here would love life? How many know you have Jesus in your heart? If you do, he will show you how to love life to its fullness. Love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from what? So there is part of our problem. Remember, walking with God is really dealing with our problem, not everybody else's. Someone say, oh, me. Come on. The problem is, is the church has a way of justifying their problems by looking at everybody else's. And you know, that's just a deception from the evil one. So let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from what? Speaking deceit. Don't say what is, isn't, and don't say what isn't, is. Don't say what good is bad, but don't say what bad is good. Someone say amen. amen. Let him turn away from evil, do good. Well, that's simple. What tree did we eat of? Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of? All right, so everywhere you go, if you don't pray and get with clo close to God, you're going to be seeing evil and good all the time. And if Satan has his way, he's going to make you see evil more than you can see good. Say, oh me. So let him seek peace and pursue it. We need to rule. We need to walk in peace. I'll show you how to do this in this lesson. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Who are the righteous? We, that's right, you have Jesus, so he in you makes you righteous. And his ears are open to what? He hears every word you utter, every prayer you pray. Just do it with sincerity. And the face of the Lord is against those who do? Now listen, let me, t let me tell you something right here. Christians, we have the authority in the earth in Jesus' name. Quickly explain. Adam was given this earth to rule in this earth under God. But what did he do? He sinned and gave the earth, whether you know this or not, this is important you understand it, gave the earth over to our enemy. Why did Jesus come? He not only came to rescue us, but to get this earth back. Say amen. amen. The earth and the fullness thereof belong to the Lord, but the world system belongs to Satan. That's why it's failing all the way around. And that's why he does it in such a, a, a weird way. Everybody's eyes are on what the world's doing. Where did Jesus say to put our eyes? On him. You see, basic Christianity will sustain you and make you so full of God and so full of good things. But what the enemy does is he confuses the issues. Come on. He confuses. He makes us to feel to mistake religion from a personal walk. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, it's a personal walk, sweetheart. It's a personal walk. Amen. And I don't know about you, I have to keep myself in God's hands for 
to make any to make any kind of sense out of a lot of stuff. Come on. And I have to I have to guide my thinking, strain it through Jesus so that I can discern good and evil in my thinking. Hello. And did you know? Maybe you didn't know this. You can control your thoughts. And you should. Don't let your mind just drift around. It might come up some company. <laughs> just joking. All right, you ready to get this? I got the hiccup, so I have to drink some water. Okay, I want to give my paragraph to you. We're going to be talking about God's compassion, how to move in compassion. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. And as you do, I'm going to read this to you. When reading the Gospels of Jesus Christ, having and moving, notice that he moved in compassion. Okay, now this is not just a word. This is not just love. I want to give you a definition too. When you get to that passage, get ready to take some notes on love. Now when... when Pastors and ministers teach on love. A lot of people say, well, I got a handle on love. I got a handle with it. But he's not talking about human love. He's talking about the kind of love that comes out of our core through Christ. That loves beyond what we see. How many know some of the things we can see? Are, no. Amen. And so... The compassion of Jesus in our heart moves us past what we see, listen, with our eyes, and what we hear with our ears. Instead, we're ruled and moved by the Spirit so we can go in and give them or minister to the people what they need to hear from God rather than just going, oh, you know, and, and judging by the side of our eyes. Now, if you study about Jesus in, write this down, Isaiah 11, you'll see that he's not ruled by the sight of his eyes, nor the hearing of his ears, but he's moved by a righteous judgment. You are should, or we should be moved by a righteous judgment. Say amen. Because who lives in us? Now, what you got to know is a Christian, stop thinking all around you. Start thinking God lives in me. And that's the problem with a lot of Christianity. They're trying to live naturally, spiritually. Yeah. Now, let me explain. In other words, we're working hard to love and, and to be with God, right? Come on. Yeah. It's a noble and wonderful thing. But the problem with that alone is you're doing it in our own strength. Right. And how many know we get tired? Yeah. And, and please don't be one of these ones. And if you are, it's okay. Lord, I commit to prayer. I commit to reading my Bible in a year. You know, when we put ourselves under an obligation like that, without God's help, sometimes we'll fall short. And then what happens? The devil's right there to say, see, you can't keep your commitments. See, all of that is a religious game. The Bible says don't vow to God at all. Just say, Lord, you got to help me to do it. Come on now. Now, if I did step on some vows that you might have had at the first of the year. It's not the intention to tear down any foundations that you have. But how many know it says, Jesus said, don't vow a vow and not keep it. So that would make you in trouble if you vowed to read your Bible in a year and you didn't keep it. It's not that you didn't. Now listen carefully. Christians miss this. I missed it for years. It's not that you didn't read it. It's the fact that that habit of Doing and not doing and having, doing, not doing, carries on in everything else you do. So today we're going to talk about compassion being a part of your motivation, a part of your very love. And, and don't be so concerned about day by day. There's somebody in here I need to talk to, and, and that is, if it fits you, remember the, the old story, if the shoe fits, do what? Where? If it doesn't fit, don't put it on. So a lot of times I, I preach and teach in scenarios, and if it does fit, it's to help you. Say amen. And so in the, the area that a lot of times the, there are things that we do consistently, we need to strain out of our life that create problems, like judging. How many of the Bible says don't judge? 
Come on, raise your hand, say it again. Now, I'm not going to pick on you. I just want to show. It says that, but what we find our, ourselves, not ourselves doing, is categorizing people. That's a judgment. You're this, Scott. Now, every time I see Scott, I'm going to see him in the box of that judgment. You see how we can be religious and not pay really attention to what God wants to do. It's the habits and the consistency of doing negative things that cause the hindrance. It's not slipping and, and missing it and make mistakes. Uh -uh. It's the habit of something. So we've got some great things to share with you today. And so did you get to Matthew? Yes. All right, let me read it to you. Let's read along. Then Jesus went out to all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel, good news of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with what? Compassion. Compassion. Uh, for them, because they were weary, scattered, as sheep having no what? Shepherd. Now, Sheep are a wonderful illustration about how we are as a human, and we'll get to that without putting anything down. But it goes on in verse 37. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. God wants us to know enough to help in the kingdom, the rescue plan, the redemption plan. Say amen. And not sit around always having your life broken, always having your needs met. That's okay. But God wants you to put together enough to help someone else. Say amen. And if you're going to rescue somebody, you don't jump in the water to do it unless you absolutely have to. You throw in Jesus. Moving right along. All right. There's a note I want to give you right at this time. The wisdom of God is being led by the Spirit. God has the wisdom. Okay. Let's not claim any wisdom on our own that we, <clears throat> at least we have the wisdom of God. <clears throat> Excuse my coffee. And the wisdom of God is being led by the Spirit on how, I mean, no, you need to know how to do things. You know, the Word of God gives us a general description that's beautiful, but the Spirit of God gives us specific instructions. So the Spirit on how to do things, when to do things, how many know there's timing? There's timing for the salvation of your children. Don't panic on what you see them doing. Start praying because your God is greater. Say amen. That was for our family, okay? So maybe my family in, in California or one in Ohio. All right, so let's go on. Another thing is, let me describe the kinds of love. So here's a good thing for you to kind of take notes of. Okay, most Christians haven't a God idea what agape love really is or how it came about. We know that God is love. Say, God is love. How many here are in God? If you're born again, you're in God. So you're in love. But you can tell anytime when you're not acting in love. Can you say amen? That's to show you, get your hands out of, from hanging out of the car. I teach a teaching that I want you to really get. I don't hear too much out there. It's not that I'm special. But we need to stay within the hedge God has given us, the protection God has given us. The reason why a lot of Christians go through a lot is they're hanging out, like hanging your arms and your legs outside of the train. Hello? You're flopping around and everything instead of going to God saying, tune me up, tune me in, and keep me within my hedge so when I do operate, if the enemy does attack, he runs into my hedge and not me. Say, oh, me, somebody. Say, that's right, somebody. Exactly. And so the churches need to be teaching you how to be the best you can be, how to use the equipment that God went through hell to give it to you. You need to be led by the Spirit. You need to be taught the main things. They're the plain things. The plain things are the main things. And let me say this. There are so many people who are hungry for the Word of God, but Satan has taken them and turned them into some Hebrew scholars that can't agree with one another. Listen, do you know anything about Hebrew? I love the Hebrew language. But if you don't know anything about Hebrew, don't be running around trying to listen to all everybody's explanations of the Hebrew. 
Because did you know that that language was dead for a period of time and it was resurrected? So they don't have the pure Hebrew language, which brings us into a situation where there's many different synagogues and nobody on the street corners that have synagogues. Now, I'm not putting this down. This is just fact. I've been to Israel. The synagogues don't agree with one another. So if you say, I want to study Hebrew, oh, you're going to be in trouble. God gave it to you in English. Do you speak English? Yes. Why would you want to then go on some journey and miss your inheritance and how to get your hands on it, how to operate in the spirit. Someone say amen. That's the truth. The enemy is really good at getting us to be everywhere except where we're supposed to be. And that is the feet of Jesus, learning his word so we can help somebody else. Yeah. That does, I'm so full of the spirit. I, I just done made myself happy. I, I really, when you, when you preach... You push out the word, and the word pushes back into you. And you breathe out the spirit, and the spirit comes. That's what preaching really is. And when you're sharing God like that, share it out of your, your, your being. So you get filled when you're sharing with people and not drained. All right, so let's get on. We just barely began to this. So here's the definitions. First word I'm going to give you for love is phileo. Everyone say phileo. That means brotherly love. We have a, uh, a city called Philadelphia. And it's anything but that. Ah, but see, that's just what the devil does. Remember, Satan's in this planet, but we're not of this planet. We're of God. We live in a kingdom. We live in a different financial system, but we have to learn to do it God's way. So it goes on. So, so love is filial love, but we can't follow Jesus with filial love alone. The next one is eros love. That's the love between a husband and wife. It's a beautiful, intimate, sexual love. Can you say amen? The, se the third one is uh, storge. This is one where people, storge, that's the kind of love that happens when two people like have a business together, maybe a husband and wife, and they grow in their love and adoration and friendship towards each other. That's storge love. It's, it's, it's kind of like a partnership love or a contractual love. It's not marriage love, but it's that way. So husbands and wife can grow up and learn to like each other. <laughs> it's a, it, you can laugh with me, all right? But see, none of those loves come from heaven. They're all good. But see, this is where Christians think that they have to love that way. No, Jesus said, love your enemies. Didn't he say, love your neighbor as yourself? Why do we always hang on the Old Testament? It's love your neighbor as I have loved you. He, he corrected that. Remember when he said that, he was under the law. Let me ask you something. When, did, when was the grace of God for the church enacted? When Jesus rose again from the dead. So when you read the Gospels, Jesus is still under the Old Testament trying to get people to see what's coming. Hello. And it's not till he died and rose again that we receive grace in the New Testament. Say amen. So when he's explaining, he says, you're to love your neighbor as yourself. They didn't love themselves. So they were failing. Can anyone follow the law? Let me see a hand of someone that can follow the Ten Commandments. None of us can. It takes God in us to do that. Say amen. amen. That's where it is. The focus is Jesus Christ. It's God in us. Amen. So here we go. So the next love is agape. Everyone say agape. You need to know this. Don't ever forget this. This love was not in existence until Jesus came. They had to come up with a word in the Hebrew and the Greek to describe the character and nature of Jesus Christ. That's why agape love is unconditional God's unfailing love that comes. Can you say amen? Now, everyone say, wow. So you need to reverence that because you have that kind of love in your heart. Scripture says in Romans that he shed abroad the love of the Holy Spirit in your hearts. 
So what happens to a lot of Christians is we don't tap the core of us. We don't tap the inward man. We're still living from the outer man. Feelings. Nothing more than feeling. You hurt my feelings. I make fun of it because that's what Satan has done to the church. They're all running around with their feelings on their shirt sleeve, picking on one another. And I'm talking about the whole church, including me. No, the focus is wrong to Jesus. And by the way, every believer in Christ, say believer in Christ, belongs to God. And if it belongs to God, you don't touch it nor criticize it, even, though, even if you think they deserve it. Because the act of criticism is worse than the critic criticism itself. Because it gets you in a habit of doing that. And Satan loves it, because every time you criticize somebody, you flip a little energy towards the devil to smack you with it. Now get that picture. Because that's what it is. There's so much white noise being taught as Christianity. Are you getting this? I'm not going over your head, am I? Linda, am I going over your head? All right, good. I want you to eat this up. Okay, we're going to cover. So agape love, okay, is love in action. Okay, so you can't tell me you love me. You have to show me you love me with agape love. Hello? You can't just say, God, I love you. You have to put some action in it because it's love in action, isn't it? How, ma how many know that God desires our worship and desires our attention and to give him and to worship him and to love him? So we want to always bring that out of our spirit because your spirit doesn't know how to doubt. Who lives in your spirit? Uh, let's get this. God Almighty lives in your spirit. Jesus is fine. He lives in earth. Can he do anything wrong? That's why we live from the inside out. Slow down, focus. Look up instead of looking around. Draw close to God so he can take us into a deeper understanding about him. Say amen. amen. All right, first one, compassion. Here's these four areas. We're going to learn about compassion today in four areas. I've got to take another sip, so... I went and lost a whole bunch of weight. I used to weigh 325 pounds. And then having what I have and all things, hiccups are one of the areas that I've tried to overcome. And so every once in a while, I'll just get the hiccups. You know, it's not an attack of the enemy. It's just a, an adjustment of my diaphragm. Okay, let's go on. We're going to cover compassion for prayer. The church has lost their compassion for prayer. Second of all, we're going to talk about the compassion for worship, to worship God. And thirdly, we're going to talk about the compassion for study and understanding, his word. Compassion for the word. Because the church has gotten away from the word, and Jesus said that he that heareth my sayings and does them is unshakable. He that heareth my sayings and doesn't do them gets slapped all around. Now, how's your Christianity? Is it solid, unmovable? And I'm not asking you to answer me. You need to analyze yourself before God every day and say, Lord, I'm still wobbly a little bit. Help me to kind of get that right. Remember, he lives in you. Now, how many here's ever been in the military, maybe the Navy? Anybody in the Navy there, Alan? You are paying attention, aren't you? Good man. All right. You know that in those bottom of those ships, they have what? They have a gyro. Or maybe several of them. Have you ever seen a gyro? That's that little top you spin. And then you try to knock it over. It writes itself back up, you know. A gyro was put in, an electric gyro put into those ships. So it keeps the boat right. So if a big wave knocks it over on its side, guess what those gyros do? <laughs> Hello? Well, you've got a gyro on the inside of you. His name is Jesus. Pay close attention to him writing you up every time you skin your knee or fall down. And remember, you're a child of God, not a sinner saved by grace. So that means that God treats you as a child. So if you make a mistake, he doesn't boot kick you Jesus over the goalposts of life. Stop treating all of this stuff that's being taught with ignorance and realize that you're his only child. He treats you like you're the only child he has. 
So is he going to turn you over to the devil to beat you up so you'll love him more? No, of course not. So finally, we're going to learn, besides compassion for the word, the last one is compassion for others and to love them. People, the church has lost compassion for a lot of others. Compassion to win souls. Compassion to go out in their neighborhoods and evangelize. Compassion for missions. These things have kind of died out. Why? Because the enemies have the church focus on the poor COVID and all the poor and all that fear, 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 fear. And if you think about it, review some of it, you'll see that it had the enemy tried to crouch everybody into a little box out of fear. And you know, we're not corralled as any animal. We only follow Jesus. Can you say amen? So I don't care what mankind says. We're not to be foolish. And, and don't be foolish, but don't operate out of fear. Say amen. All right, number one, compassion for prayer. Matthew chapter 6, please. Look at verse 6. Now, if you can't go there quick enough, just write the, write the little request down. Another thing that we offered, I know it sounds like a commercial, I don't want it to be, is if you want the notes from these lessons, you can ask for them. We give them to you. Just ask my wife, and she'll see that you get them. So, because I miss things, I like to take notes. I like to go back over the sermons and stuff. And I'm not talking about mine. <laughs> I'm talking about others that I listen to as, as far. And if you ever want to know who are the teachers I listen to, so that you don't listen to some real junk out there. Let me know and ask me personally, and I'll tell you, okay? All right, so Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 6 very closely. But you, say me. Notice it says, when you pray, not if you pray. But you, when you pray, go into your room. In other words, go off by yourself, and when you have shut the door, when you have shut the world out, pray to your Father who's in the what place? Everyone say, I want to know what the secret place is. The secret place is where God has for you. That secret place is in the spirit. Now, I love prayer. In fact, that's one of my majors. Not that I'm a real, you know, perfect at prayer, but I, I teach it a lot. So let me just tell you, there are a lot of people that believe the lie that when you're praying, you're actually praying from this planet. Well, when the Bible says that when a person, now listen, this is for you too, Pauline. When you approach the Father, how are we to approach him? In the name of? That way, you have an instant protected odd with God. You see? Daniel was in the Old Testament. It took 21 days for his prayers to be answered. It takes your prayers immediately. And the only time it takes a while is because people have to get in line to the answer of your prayer. So if I pray for a new car, the guy that has it has to get to where I can get it. So sometimes there's lengths of time in that. But when you pray in the name of Jesus, you're popped right through. Say amen. Another thing is the Holy Spirit takes you and places you up in the throne of God. Now you got to get a picture of this. It says, come boldly before the throne of grace. So you're not praying off of the planet only. Your physical is here. But you are spiritually up before the Father God. Hello? Don't be a boob. <laughs> Time you, you, you share with them the things that you want to share with them. And please, don't complain before him. He, he interrupted my prayer, and he said, Kerry, what are you doing? I said, Lord, I'm praying. He says, no, you're complaining. You're telling me what everything's wrong. I need you to quote my scripture and to believe that I will answer you. Can you do that, son? Oh, yes, I can. It's simple. The gospel is simple. I marveled that we were so soon removed from the simplicity, the simplicity that is in the gospel. You see, that's all a weird distraction called religion. Okay, are you with me? Enter your room. Pray to your father in the secret place. And your father who sees you in the secret place, which, by the way, is the throne room of God, he will reward you what? Openly. I had some friends years ago when I was studying from the ministry. I had what I call the Bible study word friends. 
And then I had the intercessory, I pray a lot, friends. I'm categorizing just for understanding. I noticed that people were in the Word all the time, but lacked prayer. They were always up, down, emotionally, just kind of racked. But I noticed the people that were hardly were in the Word, but they prayed a lot, were unmoved in every situation. Now, what does that tell us? The prayer is more important than your study of the Word, although they are both of the same. Because if you study the Word and don't have a prayer life, there's no roots. There's no stability. And that's where the church is. They hear the word, they get excited, they go to a great church, it's moving, it's grooving, it's joy and everything, but you don't know the pastor, you don't know hardly any of the people, because it's moving so quick. Guess what? You need something better. Not the church is bad. No, that's not a bad church. You need to now get personal, get down deep with God, say amen. So if you do attend a church like that, Get to a special class. Find somebody who knows who, how to teach the Word of God. We have people come here from other churches, and we love it. Why? Because they're getting things here they wouldn't get anywhere else. Not because I'm special. Because God gave us something for the end days to give out to the body of Christ. Everybody, every one of you has something for the body. Have you found out what it is? And are you passing it out? Healing in your hands? Are you laying hands on the sick? Hello, words you're able to teach. Are you teaching? Are you cumbered about with so many problems? Ah, I don't know why. See, that's a trick. That's a trick. You mean temptation's a trick? Well, what do you think? All right, still with me. He rewards us openly. So make a, make a uh, not a vow, but say, Lord, I need you to help me to really be dedicated. I want you to take me deeper. Go with me to Luke 18, please. Same point. Compassion and prayer. Luke 18, 1 through 8. You want to learn something new? All right. What's a parable? It's a story cast down to show a picture. We see in pictures, whether you think or not, imaginations, and so if I say dog, you're going to see a dog. Could be any kind of dog. But if I say black dog, now it narrows it down, doesn't it? And if I say black lab, now you know. You see the picture. The same with preaching. You need simple, good, solid preaching that's not condemning, has the nature of Christ in it, so that you're lifted up and you can see the right pictures that God wants you to see. Someone say amen. That's how it works. Jesus painted a beautiful story. So this is a picture. He says, then he began to speak a parable to them that men always ought to what? Pray. Pray. That includes mankind, all right? Ladies too. And not to lose heart. Don't give up. Saying that there was a certain judge in a city who did not fear God nor regard men. And now there was a widow in that city. And she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not. What would he do? He wouldn't do it for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because the widow troubles me. Everyone say, troubles me. I will avenge her, and by her continual coming, she weary me out. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And I'll give you an explanation. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night, though he bears with them long? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really see any faith in the earth? Do you believe God? All right. Here's the exciting thing. Let me ask you, and I know some of you know because I've taught this before. Let me tell you, the unjudged judge is not God. Because God is never unjust. Amen. And and not only that, but but it can't be God because God God regards man because God so loved the world that he gave. So it's not God. And I'll tell you, it's not the devil either. Hello, it's not the devil. It includes him. But it's not the devil. 
So who's the unjust judge, Pastor Kerry? Life. Life itself doesn't know what's good, doesn't know what's bad. I'm talking about the social order of things. Corrupted social order is called the mystery of iniquity. Doesn't know right from wrong. It's like fire. How many know fire doesn't think for itself? You take fire and throw it in somebody's house, it's going to burn it down. You put fire in a fireplace, it's going to warm it up. Hello? And so what you need to know is the unjust judge is life itself. And the widow is you and I. We're the least of the least of the least. But by our continually coming to God, continually requiring very circumstances, listen, the very circumstances of life begin to cow down to the authority of Jesus and the covenant of your prayer. Hello, if you don't believe me, read Hebrews 11, verse 3. And they changed their worlds through their faith and prayer. You are framing your world and what you want to live in and how you want to live. You need to put up some boundaries till the devil can't pass. Get your hands off of your, your children. Say amen. And begin to declare the kingdom of God. Because you were on this planet, because God gave us back this planet, our job is to invite God in. We have not because we ask not. You didn't think God into your heart. Somebody didn't pray God into your heart. You had to open your mouth and invite him into your heart. It works that way every day with your life. So don't live your life without inviting God in every day. Say amen. Boy, we can stop right there and you got enough to change your life. And I didn't, it's not things that I think about. I've been doing this for 45 years. And, you know, I fell away. I made lots of mistakes. But you know what? God raised me back up in this day to, to do what I'm doing. I have no advertisement. We don't want to put, program any self. It's not about Carrie or Linda. It's all about you. Your growth. I want to stand before, listen to me. We're all going to stand before Jesus. How, how many here know that at the end? I want to stand before him and have him say to me, and I say, Lord, here's my congregation. I did my best to take care of them to love them, to appreciate them. And anytime I'm, I'm messed up, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. And God says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I keep seeing and hearing. So that's my model. That's my goal, to give you the best I can give you. And if it's not good enough, I don't know what to say. Amen? You need, you are God's child. So you need me to be in the word, in prayer, so that I can give you what God has given me. And you know, when I'm talking, you can feel God. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know how that works exactly, but every time I preach, people gets, feel God because the Word has it in it. Not the charming Pastor Kerry. Don't you think I'm charming? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. So now we know the unjust chair. Life is very unfair. But that's why God asks you to pray, seek him, so you can change the circumstances. Say amen. Because God changes us as we require him of. He doesn't want his kids all beat up. Amen. All right, let's move on. A couple of points. Church, we are all to pray and spend time with him in order to take on his attributes, his character, and his power. We have to move towards the world in compassion. He's our model. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Notice it says, when we pray, not if we pray, we are to go in to meet with God, get our inst marching orders and instructions for the day. Why do we pray only when we're in trouble? Meet with God before you're in trouble. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Come on. Remember, you've got somebody's playing with your mind. Get them out of there. By getting into the word. That's why the word's there. To get him out of your thinking. Out of our reasoning. Come on, we all have it. Come on, those little things that pop up when you're so innocent. That you know came from hell. Or like foul and clean. He's throwing those things into your mind. Cast them down, cast them away. Two, we need to have compassion for worship. Say Amen. And I see that you've been changing in worship. 
Worst thing you can do is look at your phone when we're worshiping. That's a spit in God's face. So if you got a phone, take it out when we're in the Word. But when we're worshiping, you focus on God because He holds your life in His hands. And so therefore, smart Alec, put your life back in His hands and stop trying to run your own life. You'll find it works better. Let's move right along. Amen. We need to have a compassion for worship. Go with me to Psalms 34, 1 through 5. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. How many times? All the times. Now listen, there's a fallacy out there that says, I will thank God for all things. No, it does not ever say that. It says, I will thank God in all things. Get the difference. Satan's a master at twisting little words. Don't thank God for all things. That plane crash that kills your mama, that wasn't God. Don't blame God or bless God for things he doesn't do. He doesn't do any evil. He's all good and perfect. Say, God is good and perfect. Isn't that what it says? Every good and perfect gift comes from God. There's no changeableness. Do you believe God's... Raise your hands if you believe God's perfect. Come on, raise it up there. Because Satan wants, uses the fact that God could be. You never know what God's going to do. He keeps God in that kind of... No, no. He's good. Everything he does, good. And everything he does is... So, when he made the world, was it good? Was it perfect? But we read in verse 2, and darkness was on the face of the earth. Where'd that darkness come from? That was the fall of Lucifer. That's another subject. You want to know more about it? It's one of my majors. My pastor taught us the whole gospel and not just pieces of it. We knew about everything. Just like the Christians of Jesus' time knew about everything. They read the book of Enoch. They had all these understandings of things the way they really were. And then Satan went in and started messing with the church. And if you follow the book of Acts, you can see it worked out. Man, people were getting saved left and right until chapter 5. And Satan found a way to get in and try to hinder the growth of the church. Ananias and Sapphira. But anyway, let's go on. Third thing I want you to know is worship and praise magnify God. Say amen. amen. It magnifies God. So I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul, that's your mind, will, emotions, appetite, intellect, and personality, will make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. See, corporate worship is so powerful. Magnify his name together. Okay? I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Perfect love casts out fears. Stay with the perfect love one. His name is God. And they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This is a prophecy of those that love God, those who want to follow God. We are called the shining ones. Back in the old Samaritan history, the people that followed God shined. Moses' face was so bright, he had to cover it with a veil. Don't you remember? Now we have Jesus in us, don't we? You remember the story about Gideon? Gideon was a mighty man of valor. Actually, he was a wimp. Spineless. But he was the only man God could find to stand up for what was right. And God could take spinelessness and make him into a champion. Say amen. amen. Now listen, I'm just teaching. So he, was, he says, you're going to win this war. If you want these battles, I've got to pare down your army and get people that are serious. And then I'm going to give you this, this light, and you're going to put it in this clay pot. And then when I tell you, you're going to smack the clay pot, and you're going to win the battle. And Gideon goes, boy, that don't seem hard. <laughs> Kind of like my, my pre-Sunday school person says, you're going to put your hand into the, into the plaster and you're not going to move it. And you're going to take it out and you're going to have a perfect hand. Well, that's about where Gideon was. Now, don't get mad at me. You read your Bible. And so all you need to do is smack that little clay pot with a light in it. High clay pot with a light in it. High clay pot with the light in it. 
our body is nothing more than clay that's made into life. We have who in us? Amen. Let me share. But there's only one thing that keeps us from shining out. It's our clay pot. Are you getting this? Or am I lost you? Everyone tap your flesh and say, clay pot. Don't trust the clay pot. Trust the light. So in order to let the light out, you've got to present yourself daily to God. Say, Lord, crack open the clay pot so the light shines forth. All right, let's move right along. Compassion for worship. When we worship, that's exactly what God does. Is he smacks your clay pot and you begin to shine. You begin to soar. Don't go by your feelings. When you leave that parking lot to come into here, your flesh stays in the car. Say amen. Put it on the me hook outside. Why? If you, you ever notice that you never fight until you go into church? Or when you're about to do something for God? Now, maybe not. Some of you are too young in your marriage and stuff. Older people in the marriage. I remember every time something good was about to happen, the enemy would act up. I used to come in and I'd say, how many problems are going to be in the church? I can tell by how many problems and how good the sermon's going to be. No, I'm just kidding with you. Anyway, all right, so you get it? We need to have a compassion for worship, right? Say amen. I don't want to keep you there long. We will move to the next one. All right, the next one is compassion for study and understanding. Folks, when you read your Bible, don't read it in the natural. It was never meant to speak just to a natural man. So don't start at the beginning of your Bible. Start at the New Covenant and New Testament. Why? Because the new replaces the old. The old is not bad. We don't throw it away. But if you try to live like the Jews under the law, under the bondage of the law, you will fall from grace and the favor of God will shut off and you'll find yourself sick all the time, frustrated all the time because you're trying to mix the Old Testament that's been fulfilled and pull it into the New Testament which cancels the New Testament out. How many here have a car? Notice you have a battery, depending on the electric car, I don't know how those are, but you have a battery in the car. What two poles are on the battery? Positive and negative. How many here take one wire from one positive and one wire from one negative and touch them? What's going to happen to the charge in your car? The same thing. If you try to practice the Old Testament, if you don't do it in faith, you will cancel out the grace of God. And Paul addresses it in Galatians. He says, you have fallen from the grace of God. Get back up and get your first love going again. Say amen. Now, you can look out there in the body of Christ, and I love them, but there's so many people caught up in doing so many things that just flip the property. Oh, it's all wonderful and everything, and their life inside, they don't have what it takes to get together with God so their life doesn't fall apart. So they'll exist for a while, and then all trouble breaks loose. That's the troublemaker is Satan. And if you don't have a sword in his face... He's going to come and try to con you out of some of all the good stuff you got. He's a thief. He comes to still kill and... Yeah, and if you didn't have anything, he wouldn't come to you. So if you know he's going to come, keep within your hedge. You don't have to get up and worry about him. You don't have to worry about your kids because you're faithful to pray. Everything is within your hedge. Once you've done all that... See, I spent over an hour... Not, this is not a brag... But I tried to list all of you. Nude and Denise, now I'm going to put your husband on there. The idea is to keep that hedge around you because sometimes we don't know what to ask for. We don't know how to seek God. And meanwhile, while we're learning, somebody else can cover you in prayer. That's why we're to lift one another up in prayer. Say amen. All right. We need to have compassion and study. Go with me to 2 Timothy 2.15. How am I doing on time, okay? I do talk a lot. But I figure a 15, 20-minute sermon is not going to give you what you need to overcome the week. Remember, the Word of God is like fuel. How many near fuel in your car? You need fuel in your phone. <laughs> you need fuel to live right. Because God keeps you. 
And if you don't meet with God, then you're keeping you. And when you keep you, there's lots of holes in that little covenant. Hello? Because I can review my past. I didn't do so hot. But you know, in Jesus, he's the one that does the leading. All right. So let's study his word. It says, be diligent or study to present yourself approved unto God, not man. A worker that does not need to be ashamed. You can rightly divide the word of what? Okay, folks. Right now, the church, let's just look at the whole thing. They're not getting good, solid pictures a lot of the times. They're getting psychology and suggestions and little pieces and stuff like that. But without the Holy Spirit who puts all that together for us, we're going to still remain pretty augmented and confused. God doesn't want us that way. He wants us to study the Word of God, and He wants the Holy Spirit to bring off of the page the things that we need to know. How many here know God's got your case? How many know God knows exactly what you need? So when you pick up the Bible and take a minute in prayer, Lord, bring out of the Word what I need for today. He'll bring that very thing out. Well, Lord, where do you want me to read? Read anywhere except the Old Testament right now. Why? Because it deals directly with God being in you. Old Testament, they were looking for God, and he was coming. His name is Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we have God if we accept him. In our hearts now, we walk with Jesus Christ. That's the difference. So you see those people, bless their hearts, they're flopping around trying to be the Old Testament. They're still looking forward to things instead of enjoying what Jesus already brought 2,000 years ago. It's a deception. I'm not putting him down. I'm just saying, who's going to wake him up? Your eyes are not supposed to be on anything else. But the Lord, as much as you can, so he can guide you and give you his wisdom. Say, oh me. So in our compassion, we have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. I hear a lot of people when they talk, they're still blaming God for things he couldn't do. I don't know what God's doing. That evidence, how long have you been praying with him? I'm the kind of people that don't have very many friends because I always ask somebody when they start complaining what the problem is. Do you love me anyway? <laughs> we have a wonderful Bible study over at Linda's. I want you to come because we're teaching on some wonderful truths. I only get a, a few sessions with you. Then my wife gets a session with you for the ladies on, on Friday. So try to get as much word as you can. Our broadcasts are out there for you to subscribe and we'll send them to you. We have notes and everything. The idea is to get the word in you because the church has been struggling for 20 years. I've been in that church. I've seen all the works in this area. I see them come and go, good things, bad things, everything. But you know what? None of those ones that went were founded on the word. They were founded on what they feel God wanted them to do. Mm -mm, no, you found your church on the what? Word of God. All right, let's go to our third point, compassion for others. Now, do you, do you think in the whole, don't you think that we have a little bit of problems with each other sometimes? Come on. I think we do. And somehow, i just go over a few things with you. I used to remember sitting under some good teaching. I had a wonderful pastor, then a secondary pastor. I got a chance to preach with a lot of good ministers. But sitting under teaching, there's this real tendency to say, gosh, I wish so-and-so was there. They need to hear this. Let me say it again. When we're sitting there, oftentimes we say, gosh, I wish so-and-so was here. They need to hear this. We forget to apply it to ourselves. So when the word is being preached, doesn't matter the word is still the word. Say amen. Check on the attitude it's being preached on. If the preacher or teacher is coming against you with the word, get up and go. The word is not made to condemn you. Okay? Not made to judge you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. What? 
but that the world through him might be saved. So the idea is the enemy is getting people to fight. Once against another. Wars, rumors, of wars. But folks, this has creeped into the church. And if you study in Mark chapter 9 and you find out about the disciples, Jesus has just given them power over every devil, every disease. He laid hands on them, sent them out two by two. And then they get, uh, go out a while. And next thing you know, they get to a place where the power is gone and they're frustrated. And they came to Jesus and said, what happened, Jesus? We had great results, but all of a sudden there's no results. What happened? And Jesus said this. This is a good one for us. What were you arguing amongst yourself on the way? You see, they got the thinking, boy, this is good. I got power. I got authority. I'm one of those insiders. And then they got to arguing over themselves and immediately crossed the poles of the battery and shorted out. And Jesus says, well, what were you arguing? And they said, we were arguing over which one of us are greater than the other. You see how masterful the devil tries to bring in competition and drains the power in the church? We're containers of God, containers of his power. But you don't need to go out into the parking lot, yell at your wife, or get mad at somebody and let all that power leak out onto the parking lot and you be as empty as when you first came in. This is a gas station, folks. Hello? How many here have Jesus in you? You know he's a consuming fire, right? Our God is a consuming fire. So you got fire in you. Now we want the fire to grow. So everyone say the word of God is the fuel for the fire. The more word I get in me, the more fire can fly out. That's why Satan tries to keep you out of the word. Keep you from studying it. Because when you study, you sit down and have Holy Spirit show me and then feed the fire. Feed that fire in me. Feed that fire in me. See, you're responsible to throw it wood, it fuel. See, you are to renew your mind. You're to go after the word. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes. So say, I have a fire in me. I have fuel. And I have a fan to blow it hotter. How many here pray in tongues? How many here pray in tongues? Did you know that when you pray in tongues, you fan the flame of God's fire and it shoots out of you just like dancing flames? Oh, don't believe me? Read Acts chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit rested on them like flames of fire. Now, folks, you can't see the fire usually unless God opens your eyes. Two occasions where I have... Been in a meeting where the fire have actually danced and the fire department showed up. Sometime I'll tell you maybe at lunch today I'll share some of that with you. But see, I don't want it to sound like a brag or anything. I just want you to know that anything I experience, you can experience too. Because if anything else, I'll teach you how. Because my pastor taught us how to receive from God. He didn't teach us religion and these great ideas and, and stuff, which is good. He taught us and took us by the hand and walked us in and showed us how to do it. And that's what I intend to do with you if you will sit here long enough and learn. Say amen. Amen. Man, the fire is just burning in me. Okay, so, and I'm not just saying that. Compassion, okay, for his word. All right. All right, next point is compassion for others. Luke chapter 7, please. And we'll finish with this, hopefully. Luke 7, verse 11 says, Now it happened on the day after they went into the city called Nain, and many of the disciples went with him, and a large crowd. And when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out of the son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had what? Compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and he touched and opened the coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he 
who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to the mother. And fear came upon all, I guess. We'll just stop right there. You see, but I want to tell you, everyone say, compassion is the channel of God's power. Say that with me. Compassion is the channel of God's power. You see, we have to be motivated by love, and love in action is compassion. So Jesus was moved by? Yeah. Why? Because compassion will see beyond the problem and see to God. And you've got to have, have ask God to give you a picture of that. Compassion is the greatest, strongest. It, you know, when you have 110 in your house, compassion is 440. The volume and the strength of God's power when you move with compassion is way beyond you. It's beyond knowing. That's why we're to be led by the Spirit and move in compassion. And Jesus was moved in compassion. And what did he do? He healed all their sick. Folks, Jesus said, the works that we do, or that I do, shall you do also. We can move in compassion, can't we? That isn't you deciding, I'm going to be compassionate. You go to God and you say, Lord, fill me with compassion. Flood me with your spirit. So that when something is needing to be done and I'm close enough to be used by you, you'll move me into that area in compassion. Now, can I share a testimony with you? And we'll finish with this. Years ago when I was first saved, God used me a lot being led by the Spirit and moving in the supernatural. I believe because I didn't have doubt and belief in my life to slow me down. So I was coming up Eli Hill. How many here know where Eli Hill is? Going up to Bonnie Lake. I was coming up the hill and the Spirit of God came down in my car and suddenly I found myself on the top of Eli Hill by uh, Bonnie Lake Tavern. Now, if you don't know this area, then you would just take my word for it. Which means I was completely up the hill and didn't know what happened at that time. No, I wasn't taken by aliens. <laughs> I was caught up in the spirit. God told me there was something that was going to happen and he needed me to be there. So he moved me up the hill probably real quick, somehow, and then I'm driving down, you go down a little dip, and then you come up another dip, and there's 214th Safeway and all of that group there where I used to live. And laying in the street before the, before the stoplight, before there was any lights, is somebody laying there and about 30 or 40 people all around him. And I pull up, and God says, I need you to go over there and pray for him. Now, I'm not thinking any of this. I'm not positioning myself to be used to God. No, I always position myself in the morning to be used to God any time throughout the day. Hello? Man. And so God says, I need you to go over there and deliver me. So I'm just telling you what happened. So I got over there. It was like he grabbed the back of my neck, pulled me out of the car. I just like I was, whoa, animated. If you talk to anybody who moves in the spirit, not on purpose, but by the spirit, you'll find it's kind of animated. He moved me right up, and I said, excuse me. I'm, I'm being a little loud. Excuse me, because there's a bunch of people there looking at this man dead in the street. I didn't know he was dead. But there he was, blood coming out. He was struck by a car. And I'm going, oh, God. So I'm not analyzing any of this with my head. It's the spirit. So I said, get out of the way, please. God's going to heal this man. I reached down, put my hand in the blood and everything, and I said, God, raise him up from the dead or whatever. Heal him right now, Jesus. And people could feel, must have felt us. So they have just backed off like this. And he sat up. And he said, I've seen God. Now, I don't tell this a lot because what it sounds like is that I'm trying to toot my own horn. No, I'm not. Here's what I'm trying to do with this trying to tell you, get with God. He's your buddy. It's him and you and an adventure. Stop thinking about yourself so much and what you don't have. Say, God, use me every capacity you can use me. And this will stuff will start happening to you. Because God needs us to carry him into places. Say amen. He needs us to bring his word of good news. He needs us to bring healing. And you carry that. Now, what are you doing with it? 
well, I, I got all these problems, and you know, and you're just deceived. Get rid of that. Just cast that over on Jesus. That's not you. That's just what he's selling you. You bought the vacuum cleaner. Now kiss it off and give it to somebody else. Let's get productive. And God raised him up. And then everybody wanted to deify me. Oh! And they started coming over and trying to get... God says, get in the car and go away. So I got in the car and drove off. Why? Because we do not take any credit. God gets all the glory and will always get the glory. You say, Lord, I am a miracle right here. I'm a miracle. You get all the glory from my life. The other mistakes of that... I did, <laughs> and thou help me, Lord. Let me ask you, did you get something out of this this morning? Let's give the Lord praise. All right, so it does no good. Right?